And thank you for joining us um, this afternoon for our um, panel on the word that will be spoken in this panel, unlike the last one <laughs> on net neutrality. Um, it's hard to believe, but it's been almost 12 years since I wrote my first story about net neutrality, um, which I think if I'd known that at the time, I probably would have gotten out of the business. <laughs> if I thought I would, 12 years later, still dealing with this issue. Um, but it's one that's kept us all employed over the last decade, and, and um, I think that's really important. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see, though, if that's going to change this year. In fact, we all have to start working on other things to, uh, to earn our daily bread. So that's what the we want this. No, Amy. Probably not. Yeah. But, you know, that's what this panel's here to, um, to talk about. And so we're going to try to have some fun with this um, because this, this issue can get. Um, a little contentious and a little dull at times. So we're going to try to make this panel not like that. Um, so I'm not going to go through and introduce everybody in the panel other than one member who is um, pitch hitting for us today because Daniel Lyons um, from Boston College was not able to get here because of the snow. And so today we have Russ Hanser down here who, who uh, from Wilkins and Barker uh, who agreed to sit in. Um, he has many clients um, who he's been helping on net neutrality. Um, the net neutrality rules. Um, he's formerly with the FCC and, and worked for Commissioner Abernathy for a while, which is how a lot of you probably know him. Um, so anyway, so we're going to um, get this thing started by looking at what's probably going to happen in the next couple of weeks, because we're getting really close to the deadline where the FCC has to decide what to do. They have to actually put everything in paper and circulate it, which means that it will immediately get leaked <laughs> to Calm Daily and everybody else. And so I guess I'd like all of the panelists, starting with uh, Russ moving on down this way, um, to give us um, sort of like their predictions, highlights, or lowlights, depending on, on how you feel about this issue, um, about what you expect to see uh, in the order. Russ? So thanks, and thanks for having me. <clears throat> and apologies in advance for my voice, which is a little bit off today. Uh, so we will, you know, if, if all goes according to plan, the chairman and his staff will will circulate to the other commissioners around February 5th the, a draft of, uh, of the order he would like them to adopt. Uh, that will be followed by three weeks of negotiation of some degree, um, uh, where the offices uh, sort of horse trade a little bit. And uh, the first two weeks of those, we'll see pr probably pretty intense lobbying efforts, a lot of filings in the record, a lot of folks coming in to visit uh, the FCC and try to uh, make changes or, um, you know, or advocate their positions if they don't know what, what's, in the, what's in the draft item. Uh, during the final week, of course, under the Sunshine Rules, presumably there'll be no lobbying. The chairman can change that a little bit, but I su suspect there'll be some significant period of silence. Uh, the, on February 26th or maybe 27th or I think the 28th is a Saturday so 20, 26th or if it gets delayed I guess the 27th uh, there will be an open meeting I would anticipate an order will be adopted uh, the the signs that chairman and his staff have been giving suggest that it's a um, uh, title II uh, telecommunication service reclassification but you know it's not over till it's over so we'll see uh, things important things to watch out for I think if it does go that route uh, will be the extent of the forbearance that the Commission grants uh, to accompany that reclassification, what obligations it the Commission chooses to leave in place uh, for broadband internet access service. Um, another interesting issue will be how it, the Commission deals with wireless. Uh, that's an issue where the NPRM su suggested a lighter hand, but more recent signals suggest at least the Chairman may be moving in another direction. And then another, just inter it's always interesting for eighth floor watchers to sort of think about the politics and what's going on in the eighth floor signs indicate or have indicated that the two Republican commissioners will not be joining in the order, which changes the dynamics in terms of the negotiation among the commissioners and perhaps gives a little bit more leverage to, to the two other Democratic commissioners to effectuate changes that, that they want in the order. So um, that's all That's all I'll say, except I'll say one thing. I'll uh, give Harold kudos because months ago he was saying on social media, everyone thinks it's crazy to think we're going to Title II, but you just have to keep fighting if that's what you want and we'll get there. Uh, I don't want to get there, but he and his friends do. <laughs> and and, and uh, he, he was right in that regard that, you know, politics is a game and policy is a game where arguments and, you know, arguments matter and move, move the dial. So, but that before you start, um, I don't think a lot of people here knew, and I actually didn't know until I met you earlier, that you were second cousins with Brooks Bullock. 
who I met for the first time. For the time. first time. Uh, we have a photo on and, Twitter now. And I, it's kind yes, of exciting. Yes, it, it's very exciting, actually. In <laughs> fact, when they gave me his name tag, uh, rather than Babette Brooks, you know, it happens all the time. In fact, I've gotten some of my best speaking engagements when people thought I was Brooks. So uh, <laughs> it, it's about time I met him. And yes, he is my second cousin. Right. That's very right? exciting. So, so I'm going to start talking like this and uh, <laughs> really for the family. So, um, but yes, that's so enough about me and back to the order, right? Is that sure. What you're gonna say? Yeah, sure. Right. I mean, I think that's more interesting. But okay. yes, <laughs> let us talk about. Let's get back to work here. Uh, so, just to pick it back on that, sort of for this panel, what we might expect, I guess, in the short term, and then maybe the long term. Um, it does seem that we have a re interesting race. If uh, obviously we've had the 2014 NPRM out for a while, obviously, and lots of comments. Many of you might have participated in that. Uh, but that said, it looks like the order that might be adopted might um, have characteristics that weren't fully fleshed out in that. So there's some uncertainty, I think, in the room of exactly where we might go, including what um, the basis for jurisdiction is, which Net neutrality, people know, has been of concern in the past in that we have had to go to court a couple times, or not me personally, <laughs> I'm an <laughs> academic, so whatever. You know, you people who are paid to do that go to court, and uh, uh, with Verizon, uh, uh, we, we saw an order with Comcast, uh, we saw challenges. Uh, both times the D.C. Circuit has thrown out at least some of the plans of the orders uh, set forth by the FCC on jurisdictional grounds. So I do think that's going to be the issue foremost in people's mind as they watch how this comes out. Uh, of course, um, I'll leave a lot to, of title to, to Harold as, as, uh, as you intimated. Uh, but that is going to be a very interesting um, uh, thing. For those of you who may not be in the weeds of that, the NPRM arguably set forth pretty clearly that they were looking at what is called 706 jurisdiction, which was uh, recently found by the D.C. Circuit to be an independent support for jurisdiction of certain things in the internet, um, uh, internet system for the FCC. And so that's really what the current NPRM that we've been working on uh, has looked at, but it did call for sort of general comments on Title II. Now, the jurisdiction issue that's a little bit nuanced is that under the Administrative Procedure Act, you actually have to be pretty clear about what your jurisdiction is for the comment period. So it's uh, that's going to be a point of contention, I'm sure, as people move forward, that that was not done with sufficient particularity if we, if we suddenly shift to a Title uh, II justification for certain things. Uh, after that um, uh, sort of threshold contention, if you will, uh, there will be issues about forbearance, how, uh, if it's done at all, um, and if it's done correctly according to the statute and evidentiary requirements for that. Um, so that's another issue to watch in the future is contention about forbearance. Wireless, of course, has been mentioned. Uh, that's going to be a big policy issue. I would actually argue that's, I hate to say this, but it, it's a little less jurisdictional issue. There's um, uh, different avenues for jurisdiction in wireless that um, uh, the FCC might use licenses most famously as they go through the spectrum auctions. That's less plenary than what we're looking at probably uh, with this order. Uh, a little bit more Byzantine, and, uh, so an order has some, I'm sure, um, uh, is, is preferred in many ways. Uh, so we're going to be watching what they do with wireless as all. Well. So those are my big contentions um, that we'd be looking for. I would also not count out uh, the FTC and its reaction to a Title II jurisdiction um, because, of course, that excludes them from certain uh, under, under statute, the FTC Act, that excludes them from certain uh, um, um, sort of regulations that they can take or enforcement proceedings miraculate that they can take. So I think that would be something else to watch in the near future. So there's my sort of general yeah. what we might be seeing. In Sounds good. So now I, would have to, I have to say it was really exciting to meet you today, but I was hoping that you might bring Bill Gates with you. Yeah, maybe. Because uh, I don't know if you guys know, but next, next month he's going to be guest editing The Verge, yeah, which is super exciting. I'm lazy. 
Uh, <laughs> You're gonna go on the beach. He is much smarter than I am. Uh, yeah, he is, and that's really interesting. And uh, it's actually interesting that anyone is allowing me to speak to this group. Um, I don't have the want credential. I was a lawyer, but I sucked at it, so there's that. Um, what I do is I'm the editor in chief of The Verge, which is a huge mainstream consumer lifestyle publication. Uh, and so popular posts on The Verge include the iPhone 6 review, uh, a review of Interstellar. I sent, we hired uh, our entertainment editor away from Grantland, and we sent her to Sundance, and she's posting diary entries every month. Those are really, or every day this week. Those are really popular. Also extraordinarily popular on The Verge, coverage of Title II reclassification. Uh, what? Uh, that makes no sense. And I think, you know, I'm eager to hear about the, the wonky details because I, I care, right? I went to law school because I was a fighter for sort of like internet freedom and copyright. I was bad at the copyright thing, totally failed out. But, uh, uh, but what's interesting, the reason I'm eager to hear those details is because what we do is we communicate them to a huge public that is interested in things like, why does my cell phone suck? Um, or what it, why am I paying all this money to my cable provider for a package of channels that I necessarily don't want? Or all these things that actually turn out to be telecom regulatory issues. And what they're about is, who's talking to me? How are they getting to me? How am I responding to them? How amplified is my voice on these networks? And what we found over time, in just doing simple things like, uh, let's talk about why Comcast customer service is bad. And let's, let's go and talk to a, a hundred Comcast customer service reps about what their challenges are. Those are huge stories for us. Because people, the massive base of consumers know that they face kind of the problem of choice. They know that they only have one or two options for wired broadband at their home. They know that they only have maybe one of four big options nationally for wireless broadband and maybe a handful of regional characters or uh, carriers that don't offer as much choice. Uh, if they want to go elsewhere. And the more we delve into the sort of really nitty gritty details of this, the more they want to know because this is the stuff that affects their lives. And so I think the challenge for the FCC when they release the order, the challenge for Comcast, the challenge for the NCTA is to actually communicate these positions clearly in a way that doesn't get lost in a message that is not going over well with my readers. Right? That challenge is Here's this big body of law from a long time ago that applied to wired telephone networks. And we can do forbearance, and we can do a lot of work, and we can have a lot of lawsuits, and it will take a lot of time. But we promise you that this will somehow either increase choice or regulate those monopolists that you, who you think they're monopolists into providing you with fair rates. And on the other side, they have to say, here's this body of law, and they're going to screw up this process called forbearance. Uh, or this body of law will have all these unintended outcomes. And those people are not necessarily as trusted, right, because they're big cable. And this confluence of very complicated kind of legal and technical terminology is going to just result in frustrated consumers and frustrated citizens. And you're seeing that frustration just come pouring out. It's directed at the FCC. It's directed at the cable companies. Where it's never, we're almost never directed, at least in my experience with my readers, it's never directed at application and device providers. Nobody gets mad at Apple because AT&T sucks or Verizon sucks. Very few people get mad at Netflix because Fios is out. They only get mad at these service level providers. And changing that conversation and sort of directing the consumer to where their attention needs to go and how they can help shape policy will be the biggest challenge of this entire order. Uh, and it's one that, you know, I'm eager to see how all these sides communicate to us as the press and how our readers choose to have us communicate to them. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm interested really in the details, point. but that's sort of my perspective on it. I think it's a really interesting point because I think when Tom Wheeler came out with his initial uh, net neutrality proposal, um, what he thought it said versus what the press thought it said was was significantly different. Right. And, I mean, obviously, he's, he's changed his position since then. Well, it, it was an interesting communications challenge from his perspective. I think even it didn't work you well see the, the Republican Party has moved. Like Representative McMorris Rogers downstairs this morning, and her position compared to the Republican position five months ago has shifted, maybe not in substance, but in tone and in packaging is dramatically different now. And that's because it, it's, not a, it's not a winning thing to say we're against net neutrality. Right? That's, those are the wrong words. There are some other words that might work better that might in, implicate a different policy outcome. But the American public has said, we want these words. Whatever these words mean, we would like these words. I think there's no one better at sort of deciphering some of these words than Harold, who's been doing this for years, 
So uh, and uh, I guess there's some folks who would probably assume that Harold knows exactly what's in the order because his <laughs> former boss is over at the FCC now. So Harold, tell I, me what's in it. I wish I knew what was in the order. Um, I mean, I sort of generally know what's in the order in the same way everybody else does. Um, look, unless you got somebody in the United States who trumps not only the president, but also, you know, John Oliver, um, it's going to be Title II. Um, and it's going to be Title II for wireless. And yes, you got plenty of notice. And I know we're going to argue about it in court. And I'm going to spare everybody my lengthy ex parte on the subject. That means what I like write in the record for the FCC. But yeah, the fact that you didn't believe it doesn't mean you didn't get notice. It was pretty clear that this was on the table. It was went from on the table, ho, ho, to on the table for real, to it's going to happen, which... I'm pretty glad that's how it worked out. Um, and for me, I have to say, this is now we're coming full circle. I mean, for me, this started back in 2002 when the FCC under Chairman Powell um, said broadband through a cable modem is an information service. And a bunch of us said that's the screwiest thing we ever heard. And the Ninth Circuit said, yeah, that's pretty stupid. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, well, this is complicated, so we'll defer to the agency. And, you know, sort of the minute it finally dropped back down into reality in 2005, you know, we discovered what a wonderful world that was when Ed Whitaker, who was the uh, head of AT&T, you know, announced in sort of Dr. Evil fashion to the world <laughs> that now that they were free of all of this regulation, the first thing they were going to do is screw over the edge providers and make them pay to get to our customers. And, you know, as we've sort of moved through here, the fact is that the FCC has a 100% success rate on reclassification of broad Band. They have won every single court case, which there have also been two of, with regard to reclassification of broadband. So a bunch of us have been saying reclassification is actually a much better and safer strategy than the net neutrality rules, on which at this point you only have a 50% batting average because the last one was a split decision, I'd argue. So, you know, you put that together, net neutrality rules of a 50% chance, reclassification of a 100% success rate, so I guess the FCC has a 150% success rate on this, or we should all just admit we really don't know how the appeals are going to go. But with regard to the FCC order, I think, look, it's going to be titled to, there are a couple of things that have been pretty constant themes in this for the last 12 years. Um, the first is nobody wants to, you know, go back to tariff filing and all of these other horror stories and even if uh, even in the time when DSL was a Title II service and there was a tariff on DSL, it was pretty easy because it was just the carriers that were doing that and the resale was pretty simple. But you know what? I'm going to bet that if there's anything that's foreborn from right away, it's 203 on tariffing. Um, so we'll get that out of the way. Um, what the FCC is going to do on actual forbearance, I think that there may be a language problem, which is to say, I am fairly confident that if there's a vote on February 26th, the only provisions of the statute that will actually apply the next day are probably 201, 202, or 208, unless people are so pissed off about the Verizon super cookie that we actually add in the privacy stuff. But, which I'd like to see, for sure, because I'm pretty pissed off about the Verizon super cookie. Um, but uh, the substantively, if the FCC is going to make a decision to permanently forbear from these statutes that do the consumer protection stuff or just say, okay, you know what, we don't know how to apply these things yet, so we want to stay them. We want to make sure we've got a capacity to deal with this stuff. They will forbear in that common language sense of saying we're not doing anything on this stuff right now, but I do not know if the intent is to legally forbear from all of these things coming out of the starting gate. And in this regard, I just do need to point out if you go back even to the 2002 uh, reclassification order, to the 2005 wireline, to the 2007 uh, wireless declaratory ruling, the FCC always assumed it would have authority to deal with privacy. It always assumed it would have authority to deal with universal service, with consumer protection, with truth and billing, with interconnection, with all these other things that are entitled to. They assumed they would do it through ancillary authority and through other provisions of the statute other than Title II. That turned out to be a wrong assumption. 
but in terms of what was always the game plan, it was never the game plan to make this a regulation-free zone. It was always the game plan to have the FCC as a referee able to throw a flag on the play you know, and make sure that uh, if things were starting to get out of hand, somebody could step in. And frankly, I think the fact that the courts have spent the last couple of years trimming back every other alternative by which the FCC could actually do the job that people expect, um, which is to make sure that these you know, folks who, from where consumers are sitting, act pretty much like monopolists, have somebody to keep them in check, and the only way to get there is through Title II, I think, you know, I hope, that that is something that the FCC is going to keep in mind, that we're, we're, we're counting on them to continue to look out for us. I think this is something that brings up an interesting um a question I had about the history of this, because you know, just four years ago, Julius Janikowski proposed something very similar to what this is, the third way, which lasted for all of five seconds before AT&T and everybody else kind of came down on like a ton of bricks on him, and uh, you never heard from that again. That and I guess Verizon just, and Google, right? It, well, that was part of it, right? It was part of this compromise. Uh, so the, there was the, part the, of the, the prevailing right. conspiracy theory amongst gadget nerds, and I have no idea if. This, but this is my readers, this is the forums of The Verge, is that Google desperately wanted to put an Android phone on a major carrier uh, to compete with the iPhone. And Google at the time was uh, like super pushing for net neutrality rules. They were at the, the, the vanguard of that rules. And they, they could have provided the muscle for the third way. Uh, but Verizon, to, get, to put the droid on the Verizon network and go head to head with the iPhone, Google cut a deal. It's Google's and, fault. And so it's Google. And this is like, <laughs> when I, it sounds, I mean, like, obviously everybody in this room knows that everything is much more complicated than that. But if you go and ask the average, like, Verge reader who is, like, generally well-educated, generally makes a lot of money, generally loves gadgets and technology, that is the, just the narrative that exists, that the power of the carriers to dominate which devices and which markets exist is such that Google, which, you know, is the idealistic champion of good in the world, was forced to cut a deal to make this happen. And that, that narrative is what I keep saying is it, it's not 100% it's not true, right? Yes, Google wanted their phone on Verizon. Yes, it happened. Uh, yes, many deals are cut every day in this town. But as, every time we reveal how the sausage is actually made, the thing our readers say to us is basically we're horrified. This isn't, this isn't competition. This isn't the market competition that we were promised. And I think that's a really interesting thing to solve. So yeah, I just wanted to add one thing. That it's not like the third way proposal went away. That's part of this thing. What happened was that Janikowski said, yeah, okay, we're not going to do that, but we're actually going to keep that docket open and we're going to keep yeah. this on the back burner, which is important because all of that stuff is what goes into the notice. For four years, the official position of the FCC, and they have been asked repeatedly to close this docket, was we're not going to close this docket because we still got to consider if the court strikes down our rules, we got to have that Title II option. And so when the court struck down the, uh, uh, the rules, they said, okay, is it time to pull the Title II trigger? And a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people said yes. So that's where we are. Well, I mean, it, it went away in that they passed another rule. But yeah, I mean, it's still, <laughs> it's still there. And, you know, when you talk about a lot of people said yes, I think probably the most important person was the president saying yes. And the fact the White House came out in favor of this. Um, it, it seems to me, and Russ, I don't know if you're about that, want to talk about, you know, what kind of impact that has when you're sort of fighting against the idea of these rules, and then you've got the White House coming in and bringing, putting the whammy on everybody. Yeah, so I, I guess I want to speak to that, but maybe in a slightly broader context, which is, you know, and Harold and I are friendly, we disagree on these issues, we debate these issues. So when Harold speaks, you know, and just listening to the last thing he said, talking about, well, a few of the last things. So the game plan always was to do X, Y, and Z to have these kind of regulations. And the court said you couldn't do it that way, so we're going to do it this way. And then, you know, we need the kind of protections that the people expect. You know, what's easy to get lost in that kind of narrative is that what's at issue here is a law that was passed by Congress. And Congress is the institution that has assigned the responsibility to set policy. And the court is interpreting as best it can what Congress wants to do or meant to do, uh, you know, affording the FCC the appropriate deference. So it's not as if the idea is we have to, we should all agree that the, what the people expect as policy is just sort of what the policy should be and the FCC should take any route to get there. Uh, the FCC made a, a factual judgment about whether broadband internet access was one, or one service or two services offered together. It made its judgment, policy, consider, policy uh, decisions flowed from that. 
Uh, and to say, to say about the third way, well, they held that in the background in case the other avenue didn't work out, seems to me uh, is really a direct statement that classification is being driven by the policy considerations, whereas where we work in a system where policy decisions by the agency are supposed to be governed by the decision made at the legislature. So it, it turns that on its head. I'm not saying that folks on the other side don't also make decisions based on policy. That's what people do in agencies. Uh, but there is an overriding statutory structure that is supposed to govern these decisions. And when we go out and say, and frankly, when, when the chairman says, you know, we couldn't do, the, it turns out we can't do the things we want to do, or we think we can't do the things we want to do under Section 706, and that is why we're going to reclassify, that suggests that we are sort of putting policy over the statutory question. And the statutory question to me, as sort of a lawyer's lawyer guy, should should come first. So Babette, you were talking, you had a piece recently where you wrote that, um, and asked the question, is careful empirical analysis losing out to clicktivists and late night pundits? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and, and the question first uh, posed by Harold was, you know, I unless there's anyone more important than, than a British late night com uh, comedian and, and the President of the United States who is constitutionally sworn to uphold the laws that Congress make, I hope the answer is Congress. Um, so, and again, that sort of echoes on what we're talking about. And we're not talking about little niceties of procedure, isn't this uh, sweet? We're actually talking about. Uh, what are the limitations of the FCC? And to say point blank, well, the plan of the FCC was always to regulate is, is a little bit uh, disturbing when that plan should be set forward uh, by Congress and not by the FCC. And why it's being struck down is not to corner them into, oh, now you have, you're in the cage where only Title II will let you out. No, it's to discipline them from exceeding their jurisdictional boundaries. And that is a non-trivial uh, 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 part of the delegated authority which is given to the FCC and is constitutionally upheld because the APA is followed. Yeah, well, I just got to say. that's very simple. But I just want to, no, I'm going to yeah. follow up, too. But I, right. ju I, I also just want to follow up, too. It's like, you know, going to kind of where we didn't want to go, uh, which is Title II, you know, and talking, uh, you know, merging a little bit over to, I guess, the policy things, and, and I, I think we start more on procedure, but uh, to go on that people expect someone to have a flag on the play and things like that, well, uh, it's a gatekeeper. The FCC is a gatekeeper, and I, I am really thrown by how many innovators are coming from my state saying, listen, we want, we want uh, uh, permissionless um, innovation. And to put the, for people who have studied this and have looked at so much of this when you go to Title II, instead of having a bright line that's unregulated and regulated, it's going to come down to how are you classified? Do you have any idea how long it takes for the FCC to classify something? I, I, I think my 11-year-old was zero when SMS was on the dock. I think it's still there. So it's, uh, it, it takes a really long time to go through that process. So rather than creating a permission list where they're truly the referee, which I think they are now, I would argue they're the referee now, they're going to become the gatekeeper. So we're going to turn this from permission list to the Oliver Twist Innovation Nation, where, you know, please FCC, can you classify me as, as not regulated? Uh, so I do think it's, it, it actually is going to open up more than people are saying, whether it's through prolonged litigation or classification issues coming up. So I am concerned that it's much more complicated. Harold, did you want to respond? Forward. Yeah, a couple of things. One is I love Russ's uh, uh, answer because I argued it along with others to the Supreme Court in 2005 in Brand X and lost. That was in fact pretty much the Scalia dissent uh, in which they said policy should not drive the uh, uh, the statutory classification decision um, that should be, uh, uh, you know, dri driven from the statute. And this looks like a telecommunication service, so it's a telecommunication service. It was, you know, the carriers, the FCC, and uh, ultimately the Thomas uh, uh, majority, uh, which found uh, classification is a complicated question in which policy and how to e how to handle the policy questions is a part. Chevron deference, etc. So 
you know, I'm like, fine, tell me the rules I'm playing under and I'll play under them. If you're going to tell me, you know, if I was wrong in 2005, according to six justices of the Supreme Court, you know, you can't tell me I'm wrong now, 10 years later, and that there's no backsees and that, uh, you know, it's no longer a policy question the way it was in 2005. You know, policy and the legal statutory definition enter into it. Um, the FCC is obligated to consider, and one of the obligations it has to consider is, does it still retain the authority that it thought to fulfill the duties, and here's the big word, delegated to it by Congress. Because here's the fun thing about administrative law, and it always kind of makes me wonder what happened in the 20 years since I graduated from law school, where I learned this theory of delegation and thought this matter got settled in the 1930s, which is that whole thing about Congress delegated to the FCC broad, not nuggetory powers, which is Supreme Court 1968. That's where the whole doctor of ancillary jurisdiction comes from. All of this stuff, if you read all the FCC uh, uh, court decisions, especially out of the Supreme Court about Congress delegated to the FCC very broad authority in the dynamic and changing technical area where it intended the FCC to do all this expert agency stuff. You know, this is what the FCC is charged with doing. It's charged with upholding certain things put down both in Section 1 of the Communications Act, which I will loosely translate as make sure we have the bestest, most awesome communication system by wire and wireless in the world, accessible to all Americans at reasonable charges, to the specific delegations of authority that are given to it. And the FCC has a bunch of responsibilities that Congress delegated it under this statute to do. And what it has discovered is we can't actually do it the way we thought, not because we are a mad, power-hungry agency that lusts to regulate. I mean, God knows if you ever go into the FCC and you ask them to do anything, you know. <laughs> I know how long it has taken to classify SMS, and it wasn't 11 years because it was my flippin' petition in 2007. And yes, it's still sitting on the docket because the agency has an allergy to classification. But that hasn't stopped innovation in text messaging, unless, of course, you mean the innovation that edge providers have tried to do in text messaging because the carriers control how text messaging works, which is interestingly enough why text messaging has kind of not actually fulfilled the promise that everybody expected it to do because you can't deal with short codes and you can't get the innovation that you need because it's controlled at the center and not the edge. Okay, so let's so, go back to Russ because we're off on SMS. So let's go back to Russ, and then we're going to talk about Congress. So <laughs> let me just respond. So, so, so I think Harold... <laughs> nice segue, huh? <laughs> Sorry. So, so I, I think Harold's engaged in two kinds of um, hyperbole or, or fighting in straw men. I just want to lay them out. What it, the, sort of, the first is nobody, nobody is saying the agency lacks discretion. Of course the agency has discretion. Uh, we, you know, we have Chevron deference. Uh, the, the agency will get some form of Chevron deference, whatever it does in this matter, if, if and when it goes to court. Uh, the question is the limits on agency deference, and there are limits on agency deference. To suggest that agencies have delegated power and that therefore that's the end of the issue is silly. The courts do, with some regularity, overturn FCC interpretations. Uh, that's that's the way the structure under Chevron works. So this is not about unlimited discretion. Um, related to that point, the Section 1 point, yes, Section 1 sets out very broad purposes. The courts have also been quite clear that Section 1 is not an independent grant of authority and does not authorize the FCC to do anything it might want to do to fulfill those purposes. There are specific provisions in other sections of the Act that on which the Commission must rely. So, so I think the first straw man is the sort of agency discretion straw man. The second one, I think, is the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, I urge everyone to go read Brand X. You don't have to listen to what Harold says versus what I say. Go read the decision. It's actually a fun decision to read because, um, well, frankly, because Scalia writes one of the decisions and he's always <laughs> sure that he's right and everyone else is dumb. Uh, but, but also because the court goes through, the court, both the majority and the dissent, go through these fun analogies where they're trying to think through what's a good analogy for broadband internet access and is it like selling a car and whether the chassis is part of the car, can you say this place sells a chassis or do they just sell cars versus the pizza analogy and the dog walkers analogy. Those are really fun but they also have evidence that I think Harold's uh, exaggerating when he says that the decision was based on the idea that policy can drive law. It was really based on the, ju the justices I thought really struggling and trying to figure out how to conceptualize what broadband internet access is and whether the FCC was right or reasonable in determining that it was one service rather than 
too. So I, I just don't read the decision the same way he does, but you know, ju judge for yourself. Okay, uh, so let me, so let me say one quick, mm -hmm. one quick thing, just to um, is it? I'm sorry, Nile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nile's readers. One thing I, I would tell your your readers is go look at what folks are filing in the record because we've been talking here about Title II and we've been arguing over it on the policy. There's been tons of convergence, and I feel like there's still in the broader public the idea that the big bad ISPs are fighting net neutrality. It's just it's just not the case. The big the ISPs, the ones I work for and others, uh, are actually making filing saying regulate this, regulate that, regulate the other thing, just don't do it under Title II and do it in a reasonable way. And folks, um, I, I won't name Harold specifically, but folks sort of who are who have been fighting the net neutrality fight for a long time will say, well, they're only saying that because we're beating them. Well, the policy debate has proceeded and it's proceeded to this place and we can talk about why that happened, but the fact is they are actually in there trying very hard to be productive parts of the debate and, and taking positions I suspect they're not getting credit for in the wider community. Oh, well, I don't doubt it. Um, trust me, uh, Verizon and Time Warner and Comcast are very eager to tell me what they think all the time. <laughs> uh, I mean, just ceaselessly me, tell me Me too, what as it turns out. Uh, Facebook ad targeting, by the way, very effective and uh, utilized against me and my staff. Well, I'm kidding. Um, but it is very effective. Uh, no, you know, I think the response to that is I, I hear you when you say the policy is moving. But I think the, the core issue, and I'm going to stay out of the wonkiness of the law, and I apologize for that, but you guys are better at it than I am. Uh, the core issue here is trust. And I think what you're hearing from the consumers, and the, the policy could go the right way. And Comcast and Verizon, I mean, Comcast is saying the right thing. They're saying we, we've already agreed as part of the NBC deal to abide by these rules, even though you threw them out. Like, we'll, we'll stick with them for a number of years. But the issue is that consumers don't trust Comcast. And they have no method to express that distrust. Because most people who have Comcast can't leave it. And if they can leave it, then they have to pay DirecTV for a TV package and a worse broadband provider for a broadband package. And they end up paying more for maybe better TV service, but almost certainly worse internet service. And that preference keeps them on, on Comcast, because what they want is better broadband. And so because they can't express their distrust, what they're saying is, I would rather believe the government. And that, like, it, in a market situation in the United States of America where, like, consumers are saying, I can't vote with my dollars, so I'm going to vote with my vote, is kind of crazy, right? For, like, just in this room, like, you are all lobbyists and legislatures and executives. For consumers to say, I, don't, I have so little choice that I choose to trust the federal government's decision-making authority and the regulatory policy to provide me with a better service is crazy. But that's where we are. And that's, so I hear what you're saying on the policy, right? I, I get sent the white papers just like you, and we, we publish the positions. We try to be responsible journalists. But the overwhelming response is, well, what if they're lying? What happens then? What's my recourse? And the recourse is almost nil in every case. And I think that's the biggest issue here. I think Neil actually has a great um, essay that he, that he posted online that if you just need to Google, uh, the internet is effed. But we can fix it, and you can, it's a great essay, actually. I highly recommend you read it, um, because it really kind of gets into these issues of competition, which I would love to get to, actually. Um, we've been talking a lot about the past, and so I, and this, this panel is technically supposed to be about the future. <laughs> um, so I do want to ask about Congress, but we also want to um, open this up to questions from the audience. So I will ask one more question about Congress, and then um, if you have questions, either tweet them to me or uh, start thinking about them now, because we will turn it over to you all soon. And I will have other questions if you guys don't have anything. Um, but I did want to ask about Congress because um, we finally have a Republican bill on net neutrality, which is the first time because previously they said basically there wasn't need for legislation on this. Um, and I guess I wondered if it's not clear to me why Democrats would want to sign on to this because they're about to get Title II, which is the thing that they've always wanted. So I wonder if you all could sort of, well, at least you know, some of you just sort of address this and, and what you need to do to try to get legislation through at this point. Or is that even possible? Harold, did you want to start? Yeah, I mean, look, first of all, quickly, just we got first of all, it's important to have a, a little historic perspective. There was an, a, a Republican effort in 2006. In fact, it was a bipartisan effort because it was bipartisan. At that time, net neutrality was much more of a bipartisan issue. Um, and it was called the COPE Act. Um, and net neutrality was the issue on which this rather ambitious attempt to reform the Communications Act crashed. Because, and it was over the same question, which is, are you going to let the FCC have jurisdiction to try to deal with this, or are you going to just say, okay, these are the things you're afraid of, we'll deal with these things, and we'll cut off all FCC jurisdiction for anything else. And the real issue here at this point for me is, look, you might as well fold this into a COM Act 
complete uh, rewrite because broadband is the essence of the, the, the communications uh, future. If the concern is the, com the Communications Act is outdated and you shouldn't subject broadband access to this Title II stuff, fine, everything's going to be broadband. So you want to rewrite the Communications Act because you don't want to be in a situation where you have very severely limited the FCC's jurisdiction to deal with a whole bunch of policy stuff that Congress has generally delegated to the FCC um, while they're trying to figure out the next step, while at the same time um, not actually be able to come to resolution. So at this point, I'm kind of thinking, all right, why don't you just fold it into the whole general rewrite then? So Russ, about you, one of you want to address this, have it a sort of a broad communications act, or do you just have like a really more narrow bill? Either of you want to address that? Well, I think there are two things going on. I, I do think that there has been attempts at the COM Act, uh, doing a new COM Act. O obviously, the uh, 1996 was a tremendous effort legislatively, took a, a great deal of time. So I, not to uh, wonder why the senators do that, but I think it's fairly obvious that certain things that they want to stop that might have um, detrimental effects is why they did this shorter version to uh, again, that echoed some of the things that came out in a bipartisan manner about not going to Title II and not going to um, uh, reclassification of ISPs, and, and that did come out earlier. Uh, so I think it was trying to grab a little bit that people could uh, have some consensus on and move forward to, I think, uh, there's fairly wide recognition wide recognition that we are going to need a new COMAC, but uh, but to stop going sort of backward before we can go forward again and creating more um, more issues, I think, is why you're seeing this smaller one right now. Um, and it, it um, you know, the timing is no mystery to anybody that it's because there's been such pressure on the FCC to go forward with this reclassification, not even so much with rules or or uh, new policy making, but the Title II classification and what that and what that means for these industries have that have not been under Title II. This is, you know, not the Brand X world. It's not where it's coming out of pure telephone, but you're going to have satellite, you're going to arguably have, you know, cable and others who have never been under that. So it, cr it causes a crisis um, of certainty and sort of the inv investment groups and, and what have you. So it's, it's hard to um, 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 think that maybe just stopping that FCC process isn't of merit by the senators. So. Okay. So we wanted to open this up for questions. I have more questions up here, but we'd also be happy to take questions from the audience if anybody has anything. I did want to make one oh, comment yes. to annihilate what earlier you said about, uh, again, like Netflix and your, and, and your readers talking about um, they, they just don't know who to get mad at. They know who to get mad at. Right, <laughs> you know? They're very clear. <laughs> so, Smart people. Uh, but, it, but it's very interesting when you come through it and, and looking at sort of that uh, behind the scenes and, and, and the different contracts and, and things that have happened and the, and the history of contracting in this area. And uh, as sort of a, a, a sort of, <laughs> I tell my students that, as sort of a professor of contracts, <laughs> I, I call it learning contracts with Bullock. They just don't know what I mean by that. And uh, so when I teach it. But uh, I, I think that's important. I, I, I really think that that kind of transparency of everything, sort of like how the economics of it work, is really meaningful to consumers uh, because there is a lot of power there that I think is underutilized because it is not directed at, at all the right uh, points. So I, I, I applaud you trying to ferret that out. Well, I mean, as sort I, of an economic remedy. But, I mean, uh, the, my response to that is, I think, I mean, I think it's fascinating. I, w I would have never predicted that doing this coverage would be as popular as it is, mm -hmm. ever. Um, it, it has been surprising every step of the way. Um, but what's the flip side of that is, you just said there's intense pressure on the FCC to go to Title II. And that is only real insofar as that is the last remedy the FCC has, right? It's the last step it can take. But if Verizon hadn't sued against the open internet order and the rules hadn't been overturned and paid prioritization hadn't gone back on the table, the consumers wouldn't give a shit about Title II. Yeah. Right? Like, what they want is they don't want slow lanes and fast lanes. What they want is they don't want to see their internet service buffered. What they are beginning to want more and more and more is for wireless to be treated like wired. And they don't really care about what the people in D.C. do to accomplish those goals. 
what the FCC is now telling them and what advocates like Harold are now saying is our only method of going forward is Title II. And I think what you see Congress saying is, but what about, what if we just take all those provisions and we put them in a bill and we call them a bill, and at the bottom of the bill we, we say, and you can't use 706 to do anything else because damn it, right? And that's basically that bill. And I think that will work insofar as that it's what the people want, and if they get it, that's fine. But it's a remarkable policy, policy shift on the part of the Republicans who, a few months ago, were all for paid prioritization, and they were all for two-sided markets, right? And so what you're seeing is the consumers are saying, we want these policy outcomes. We don't care how you get there. And now you see all, both sides of the debate arriving at those policy outcomes. And so saying the pressures on the FCC to get to Title II, is, I mean, it's literally like it feels to me like a race between policymakers to get to the outcomes faster and take credit for what everybody thinks should happen anyway. Well, what, what interests me about that statement is it suggests a rift, in a sense, between your readers and some advocates. Because right. I think you're right that for the average U.S. consumer, Title II versus Section 706 is kind of not relevant. Uh, it may be relevant down the road. I mean, if, you know, there I would may probably, be real... It should, should never be relevant. No one should <laughs> ever have <laughs> right. to learn about <laughs> this. <laughs> My mom should sorry. never have to worry about Section 706. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, yeah. sorry it should like, never be relevant. Actually, I'm, I'm it, actually going to disagree with that. <laughs> oh, so. it may be, okay. So it may have... Wait, wait, wait. Let me right, right, disagree after. Mm -hmm. so, so it should never be relevant in the sense that, like, it doesn't matter to consumers what legal means you use. It may be relevant in the sense that if it deters investment or has other effects, either right. way right. it affects them. But, but for some, I think Title II itself has become a, an end rather than a means toward an end. I think in the 2010 debate, it was entirely a means toward an end. Uh, in the 2014-15 debate, it has become for some an end. And we're at a stage now, and the, le the legislation really highlights this, where lots of people are willing to agree to get to those rules under different means. And you know, we can argue about whether the draft through legislation gets ex exactly right or not, or, 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 or you know, I'm sure different people have different views. But generally, there's a sense that there are ways to get to the same policy outcomes you're you saying your readers want without the, the baggage of Title II. And I think there are, are some for whom that's not enough. And um, that's just an interesting rift and distinction for me, and whether whether we get there via Title II or elsewhere. Uh, I think well, that might get back to your trust issue. Right. Yeah. right. Let, I mean, let me let me just add the one or two quick things. One is, I don't think consumers are begging to be ripped off. <laughs> I don't think they are begging to be on hold for three hours with Comcast when they try to cancel their service. I don't think that it is okay with them that their broadband provider decides to track their every move without telling them for two years and puts a big neon sign on their back saying, if any third party wants to know what this person is doing online, here's how you find that out. I really don't think that's what consumers are begging for. The net neutrality issue became the distinct issue of the moment because it was such an obvious and naked thing. And for consumers who were sitting there saying like, I'm trying to watch my goddamn Netflix. I've paid you, Comcast, Verizon, at and everybody else, big bucks in order to be able to watch my goddamn Netflix, and you're telling me that's still not enough for you unless Netflix agrees to pay you more, fuck you. That's really <laughs> what's going on here with net neutrality. But they, there is they a do know who to get mad at. They're very clear. Right. Very we, clear. we are all in. Exactly. Exactly. here. This is not being broadcast. Problem, but, 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 uh, there you go. <laughs> but there is That's a broader question. issue that they're not going to be any happier about no, Harold's this. just reading comments on the verge. Yeah, She's yeah, not yeah, even... Yeah. This, is like, <laughs> this is like basic. He's just reciting. This is not me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there is one thing that I want to seriously disagree with Amy about, which is... You tell. The big thing that I said that Russ pointed out at the beginning, which is I believe citizens' movements are citizens-driven. And that for me, actually, the biggest thing about this, and the reason why I am not quite as surprised as others at about how this coverage has gone on, is that we are seeing for the first time people saying, this is a thing that matters in my life. And I recognize that this government thing, which huge corporations have spent literally trillions of dollars over the last 40 years to persuade people to distrust, is actually the thing that our forefathers got together about and that 100 years ago in the first progressive movement they realized was the counterweight to giant corporations. 
And that, that is why this ancient fusty communications law is so good at cracking open monopolies and protecting consumers. Because it came out of an age when actual citizens were active in the drafting of these things and demanded of their legislators that they give them some kind of counterweight to these giant companies. And I frankly hope that people will be concerned about what 706 says, what the privacy <laughs> bill that is being introduced that will determine their relationship and how much they're able to keep secrets online and offline as these things merge. And I'm really hopeful that we are coming to an era when people realize that Washington is not some closed thing that you walk away from so that other lobbyists can do their work. It's something that if you're a real citizen and not a couch potato, you take an interest in. So my point was just that I think <laughs> that, like Neelay says, that I don't think that readers actually care about legal authorities as much. They do care about the outcome, and that they're more outcome-driven, perhaps, than process-driven. That was my point, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's, okay, so I think Barron's actually, his head's going to explode, so we need to let him ask the question, and then we'll also let everyone else. So, yes? Well, since, since Harold's already ruined the G-rating for this panel, I'm just going to say, this is bullshit. <laughs> Republicans offered to solve this debate back in 2006. They got 215 Republican votes in the House. They got 102 Democratic votes, the majority Democratic caucus, to authorize the FCC to enforce its 2005 policy statement. Okay, That would have solved this. And yes, Harold is correct. That issue got tied up in the Senate for all sorts of political reasons. That was chance number one. Chance number two, there was an opportunity to negotiate an end to this deal. And no, it wasn't because Verizon was holding Google over a barrel. It wasn't because Verizon has all the power in the world. Google and Verizon hammered out a very sensible framework that could have gotten bipartisan support. The chairman, to his credit, tried. Mr. Waxman, to his credit, tried. And Republicans, I'm sorry to say, as far as I can tell, seem to think that they'd be better off waiting until after they won the elections. And then the chairman went off and did his thing after his own staffers blew up the legislative deal. That's how he went up the 2010 order. So now here we are, and we have a legislative proposal on the table that delivers all four of the things that the president wants. Public knowledge likes to say that it doesn't do what the 2010 order does. That's just not true. It does even more than the 2010 order does. It would do the things that Title II can't offer, like subjecting wireless to the same rules, like categorically banning paid prioritization. And it's still not enough, because for Harold, this is all about Title II. It's not about net neutrality. It's about maximizing the FCC's discretion to do whatever it is he wants it to do as a knight errant on the progressive march against big corporations. That's what this debate is about. It's not about net neutrality or blocking or transparency or any of those things. It's entirely about the FCC's discretion, which Harold can't bear to constrain unless it happens to be about copyright. And there, public knowledge is wonderful in pointing out to us how dangerous the SEC's ancillary jurisdiction was in, for example, the broadcast flag case. But they don't seem to have any problem with the FCC having that kind of power under Title II or 706. So once again, Harold, since you've decided to make this obscene and, and to scream and shout, this is bullshit. You have an opportunity to end this debate so we can move on and talk about things that matter, like actually clearing barriers to broadband deployment or opening up spectrum or any number of those other things, but you want to keep this debate going. Okay, so I think Sarah had was not to a shoot question, me if I were to concede on that. That's why she's sitting in the front row. <laughs> I'm just. What was the question? There was no, actually not. I'm actually really glad at this. <laughs> No, no, no. So I'm just glad we did not bring booze because if we had, like, like, chairs would have gone through the window. It would have just been a madhouse. So we do have another question well, over here. Drunk telecom policy. <laughs> drunk telecom policy. <laughs> so I, I have another question. You know, Carol, you're not going way back. And it's for anybody. So, so what's so interesting about this debate, though, is the fact that um, it's become a big company, little person complaints kind of argument when really I think the base of the argument was focused around strong net neutrality provisions to ensure that the internet was open. And, you know, there's a part of me that says, you know, and we advocate, you very clear about where we are, we don't support Title II in its entirety, because I think, you know, I, the question I have is, the FCC with light-handed regulation is what created the tools that we have now. But now we're sort of suggesting that the FCC under Title II should sort of mitigate complaints which then makes me kind of nervous that are we going towards Title II to actually instruct, bring instruction on how to deal with net neutrality 
or is, are we trying to go to Title II to actually regulate the internet in a broader sense that has nothing to do with this debate? And to your point, Harold, I mean, I just spoke to a local community group in Wisconsin, black community group. The fear that they had was, well, if you go to reclassification and it's like my energy, then that means you're gonna need a low-income uh, broadband assistance program because the rates that I pay for energy, I can't afford. So I, I guess I, the question I have is what, is, what is at the core of this debate? Because I think it's become so inflated as to the start and the end. And I think it's, a, you know, it's kind of dangerous if we're, we're sort of looking at these two worlds of innovation and regulation that may not generate the same types of, type of results, and you know, particularly for the constituents that we serve, that we want to see when it comes to the aspirations of broadband. So I, I you know, outside of my person, I blank bear and I didn't use the F word. Um, I just want to get some sense of, you know, is there really more to this that you're not telling us, Harold? <laughs> and I wish I knew how I got to be the spokesperson for the debt neutrality movement. I feel bad for all my colleagues here in the room. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but here's the thing. I mean, look, we've been pretty open since we first filed in favor of Title II back in 2010, um, where we pointed out that in addition to the concerns around blocking and degrading and all of these other things, we cared about universal service, we cared about um, uh, privacy, we cared about consumer protection. All of these things we argued were significant and important and were certainly much more straightforward and easy to accomplish under Title II. So yes, I mean, as far as we're concerned, there are a lot of issues. Now Congress can deal with all of these. If you don't, you know, if you tell me, all right, we won't do it under Title II, we'll do it under 706. You know, I think 706 has a lot of issues with it. It's less constrained, it's more uncertain, it places competition and investment at the center rather than consumers at the center. You know, so for all of these reasons, I'm not wild about a 706 uh, uh, approach, but you know, one of the things that uh, um, you know, public knowledge had said was we thought a 706 approach was dumb um, and we didn't think it was necessarily a good idea and it was probably bad policy, but you know, if you wanted to do it that way, it could, with some monkeying and so forth, possibly be made to work. But again, there's sort of a, then why bother? You know, my question on a lot of these is, yeah, we do the light regulation thing. We did the light regulation thing under Title II. That's, if you like today's telecommunications market, I will remind you, you know, a boatload of this came out of Title II, including the wireless industry, yeah, which, again, on its voice component has always been regulated and continues to be regulated as Title II. So, you know, I don't think that there's a difference here. I'm sometimes perplexed at, for me, what is the religious fanaticism on the, ti on the anti Title II side, which is I'm saying, so like, what's your deal? I mean, you know we're not gonna do tariffing. You know we're not gonna do tariffing. Are you saying you hate privacy? You know, are you saying you hate truth and billing? Are you saying you hate um, the, uh, uh, the idea? So, okay, so, so if the policy stuff is converging, then from my perspective, okay, why don't you go with the way that Congress intended, with the way that this works, with the way that the court in the Verizon case pointed you to, you know, and say, do the thing. Do the Title II thing, it works. We've got a lot of experience showing it works. You know, what the hell this anti, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but you know, if you're talking about who are the religious fanatics on this, you know, the notion that the day after classification, stock markets are gonna crash, planes are gonna fall out of the sky and the earth will open up and swallow our broadband infrastructure is kind of silly. And I'm, I'm, I'm just not getting it. In theory, we all want the same thing, you know, I happen to think Title II is the right way to do it, and it's the statutory way to do it, and it's what Congress intended. Okay, so one, and then we're gonna just a quick follow-up, though. But I, I, you know, to your point, Harold, I think I think we all do want the same thing. But I liken it to the um, desegregation of schools, for example. We wanted schools to be integrated, but now we're dealing with a bigger problem of equity within school districts. So I think the question becomes, how do you get to a resolve that actually, again? I don't, I don't think we should use the word love and hate because, you know, I'm like a hippie. I just, <laughs> we all love different things, and on one side, you know. But with regard to the focus group you talked to, yeah, we have a low-income credit program for people who cannot afford it. We call it the Universal Service Fund, and it applies for telecommunications services. So on a happy sort of we're all loving each other sort of note, um, 
um, we've got like 30 seconds before we have to, <laughs> to go to, to cocktails. Okay, so I don't... I don't so, uh, so, no so, pressure. Let's, let's, let's I, I, to the next. Two points. I, I've never written a pleading saying planes are going to crash if there's Title II uh, consideration. But I don't think anyone else has, and I know it. But, yeah, usually uh, that only comes but, up. But on that point, uh, I cannot recite it, but um, I... While you're reading Brand X, after you read Brand X, I urge you to go and I mean, look at the comments that Public Knowledge Harold's organization filed with the Benton Foundation and others. It's easy to say now nobody's going to do tariffing, nobody's. But actually, when you look at the list of, of provisions that they urge the FCC to keep in place, it's not just sections 201, 202, and 208. And it's nice to say, trust us, but A, we don't know what happens in the negotiating will come out of the negotiating room. Nobody does. Uh, B, even if the right thing comes out of that room, we don't know what the courts do with it down the road. And C, we don't know what future FCC chair women or men will do with that. So there's a lot of, there is a lot of uncertainty, and I think it's a little, um, well, I think it's not quite right to, to suggest, you know, we can all just sit back and be comfortable that only these very uh, relaxed rules, and by the way, they're not relaxed. Section 201 is a pricing regulation provision. So I have to say, you know, I've moderated probably dozens of net neutrality panels over the years. I've never had one with so many F-bombs. So this has been really entertaining. And I hope you will all join us in thanking our panelists for today. It's been fun. And also just a housekeeping note, if you're looking for the booze and the apparently amazing hors d'oeuvres, they're downstairs on the seventh floor in the big room where they have the, the, bar, the big things. Thank you so much.